Hello, and welcome to Central Booking, where writers and readers are the authority. I'm your host, John Valeri. Today, I'm joined by Connecticut's own Dr. Jan Yeager, a prolific award-winning author who has more than 50 books to her credit. Her newest is Friendevity, making and keeping the friends who enhance and even extend your life. It's a prescriptive self-help book that illuminates the health benefits of cultivating the right kinds of friendships while also teaching us how to recognize the wrong kinds. Topics include friendships throughout the life cycle, emotional and physical distancing, the workplace, illness and death, fatal friends, and even social media, which is particularly timely given COVID-19 pandemic restrictions. Liz Pryor, author of What Did I Do Wrong, praised, Frangevity is an astoundingly provocative read on a topic that remains so important to all of us. This is a book that provokes self-awareness and at the same time provides a usable roadmap to understanding the questions, fears, and celebration we experience around the friendships we value so much in our lives. Dr. Yeager is also a friendship coach, sociologist, teacher, professional speaker, and expert in multiple fields of study who has been invested in the topic of friendship for decades. Her extensive original research is referenced throughout Frangevity, as well as the earlier titles When Friendship Hurts and Friend Shifts. She has been featured on popular TV shows including The Today Show, Oprah, The View, Good Morning America, CBS Sunday Morning, and ABC's Nightline, among others. An author of both nonfiction and fiction, including children's books, YA, poetry, and textbooks, Dr. Yeager's works have been translated into more than 30 languages worldwide, and she has been published both traditionally as well as through her own independent platform, Hannah Croy Books. This breadth of experience informs her other recent release, How to Self-Publish Your Book, a complete guide to writing, editing, marketing, and selling your book, which Publishers Weekly called Invaluable. Invaluable. That's also a good word to describe Dr. Jan Yeager herself. Listen in and you'll see why. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Central Booking. I am speaking with Dr. Jan Yeager today. She is the author most recently of Friendevity, Making and Keeping the Friends Who Enhance and Even Extend Your Life. Here is the cover. I just scrolled away from the cover. There it is. And so this is currently available as an ebook and audio, but it will be coming out uh, physically in paperback very shortly as well. Very timely topic, but I have to ask you, Dr. Jan, you know, you have been invested in this topic and research of this topic for decades now. You're trained as a sociologist, you research, you study, you write, you teach. What compels you so much about friendship that you're still writing about it these many years later? Uh, well, I think a big part of it is that uh, friendship has evolved. Uh, my last book, which I was mentioning to you earlier, I can't believe it's 19 years ago, it did help to get people talking about um, negative friendships, which people hadn't wanted to talk about before, when friendship hurts. And my very first book published 25 years ago, Friend Shifts, which was an outgrowth of my dissertation on friendship, that was really about how who our friends are can change over our lifetime and even the concept of friendship. But I realized that the, the research that's been done in neurology, in medicine, friendship has really become an interdiscipline, di disciplinary topic. It's not just a sociology topic that deals with relationships. And the neurological and the scientific research was telling us that friendship can not only extend your life, but it can slow down or even avoid the onset of dementia. It can make a difference in whether or not someone recovers from cancer and heart disease. And one of the strongest findings, and the reason why I wrote Frangevity, and obviously the word Frangevity is a combination of friend and longevity, is that loneliness, which is very different from being alone. Loneliness is not having even one friend. It is a risk factor that's preventable in premature death up there with smoking, inactivity, 
and obesity. So there's a lot of new material, new research, new insights about friendship. And that's one of the reasons why I did the new book. Sure. And I have to say it was illuminating to read because as you touched on, you know, when you think of mortality and death, you think of the more common causes, you know, like smoking or illness, cancer, car accident, and you don't necessarily think of loneliness. But I want to say, is it top 10? Did you like number 10? Uh, number four. Number four. Wow. And even higher when you think of things like suicide. Right. Uh, lack of connections is, is one of the top uh, reasons for that. Uh, my chapter on frenemies and fatal friends, uh, that was a very difficult one to write because two years ago, my great nephew, uh, my husband's brother's grandson, uh, on a Friday night, he got into a car after going out with his friends and um, he thought that, you know, they were going to the next place to have fun. This is pre, pre-pandemic when you could go out and not worry about at least the drinking part. He's 25, so he's legal to drink. And sadly, um, his friend uh, crashed the car and our uh, great nephew uh, died instantly. And that's why I wrote the chapter on frenemies and fatal friends because friendship decisions, you know, when he got into that car, he didn't think, oh, this is not going to be, I'm not going to have tomorrow. You know, he just thought he's hanging out with his friends. And there's so many cases of friends really being a life or death decision, which is very different from longevity. Longevity, we're talking about you know, some of the factors about premature death, you know, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. But here we're talking about, you know, um, teenagers and uh, young adults. So, you know, it's, uh, it's, not, it's not the extra relationship that people used to consider it. You know, it's, it's really pivotal. Absolutely. And I wanted to ask too, you know, in speaking of, you know, the chapter about fatal friends and frenemies and this, I think, you know, holds true for the entirety of the book is there are interactive elements, you know, throughout where readers can sort of do a self-assessment and take quizzes and sort of understand whether or not they're in positive, healthy relationships or relationships <laughs> that maybe need to be reconsidered. So can you talk about yes. the elements of the book? Well, I, that's interesting you said that because um, I actually like to do a book's index because it gives me an opportunity to, you know, revisit the material. And when I was doing the index on um, self-quiz entry, I was amazed that there were 10 right. self-quizzes because <laughs> you're just doing it chapter by chapter. Sure. Wow, there are 10. Mm -hmm. uh, one of them is in the chapter on uh, conflict. And it says, um, is this friend good for you? Uh, because in that chapter, I help people decide, you know, do you want to wind down this friendship? Do you want to end it? Do you want to put the time and energy into salvaging it? Uh, I'm really happy I still have a good friend. I spoke to her recently. Uh, back 30 years, no, I guess 30 years ago, um, she had a uh, birthday party. It was a surprise birthday party. And my then boyfriend, I didn't marry him. Luckily, I went on and married my husband because my husband never would have done that. But my then boyfriend didn't want to go to her birthday party because they weren't friends. And I should have just gone on my own. But um, as many people do, they say, oh, you know, I'm a couple. Um, my friend will understand. Well, she didn't understand. But this friend was very important to me. At that point, we'd been friends for about five or six years. Now it's, you know, 30 something years. But I literally had to court her for right. the next couple of weeks to win back her friendship. I, I think I even sent her flowers. I, I sent her a card apologizing. I called her and apologized. 
and you know eventually she forgave me but but it was worth it because the friendship meant a lot and you know but if it wasn't a, a friend that I felt I was invested in you know that was a lot of time and energy and right. also it took the self-awareness that gee you know what I should have shown up at that party you know I, I should have said to my boyfriend hey you know you know go go watch tv go meet with your friends i'm going out and it was it was not around the corner it was like an hour and a half drive right you know which which is one of the things that challenges our friendships and one of the questions i was going to ask you to ask me was how not just the pandemic but you know people moving away and the tests on friendship you know are you going to put forth that effort Sure. And actually, I'm going to piggyback on that thought really quickly, if you don't mind, because, you know, you had that experience yourself. You've been in Connecticut for a while now, but a period of time ago, you relocated for your husband's work. And so you found yourself in Nashville. So not only did you, you know, have the challenge of maintaining the relationships that you'd already made, but were now put at a distance, but you found yourself in a situation where you sort of had to attempt to create a new network. So can you talk right. about how being in that position affected you? Oh, it was it was very traumatic. Um, at the time, we had a cat, and I believe that cat hung in there because that cat was, for a while, my only connection. Because I did I did form some connections in Nashville, but it was much harder than I ever dreamed. Also, we didn't know how how or if my husband's job at the time was going to be a long-term situation, I probably in hindsight should have thrown myself into even getting a job at, you know, anywhere sure. just to have that forced connection with people. But because I was basically just um, working on my own, um, it was very hard to make friends. It also, I forgot how clicky people are. And they, you know, one of the things I talked about in friendships, because at the point I wrote friendships, I had recently relocated from Manhattan to Connecticut. I could have gone to London because, you know, it was a whole other world. Um, you're going into a situation where other people have their network set up. So it's you who needs to make the new friends and they, you know, there's risk involved in friendship. There's right. trust, there's sharing. So it's not something that happens overnight. In friendships, I found based on my dissertation research and other interviews afterwards that it, it can take as much as three years to develop a tried and true friendship. Now that doesn't mean you don't have an instant fast friend arrangement, but that's gonna pretty much be someone, you know, you go out to lunch with, you go to the movies, but the kind of, you know, hey, it's, you know, seven in the morning and I'm feeling depressed but I, I call and the person doesn't make it go to voicemail. They actually pick up the phone or they answer your text right away. So that, that takes time. So the Nashville experience really reinforced how important friends are. And keeping up with my distant network, um, I think the only thing similar now is Zoom and video conferencing is helping people to keep up. Um, but you, there's nothing like face-to-face -face interaction. So, um, so, you know, Zoom is better than just a phone call. A phone call is better than just a text. A text is better than just a Facebook post. Um, but you need those uh, connections. Also, you need people who share the same uh, reality. In other words, Nashville, which is a wonderful city. And, you know, you go out 
to dance and to listen to music. And you want to share that with people who understand the Nashville experience. So, you know, your friends back in Connecticut or New Jersey or New York. I know in New York, they tried to have a Nashville type of um, venue. And sadly, it, it didn't uh, take off mm -hmm. uh, because it is very much country music and, you know, Nashville. And um, so, you know, so that's why people who move on, they need to have those new relationships, um, as well as keeping up with the old ones. Sure. And I was going to say, in your experience, since you didn't know, you know, how long you were going to be gone, it was probably even more beneficial, you know, to keep up with that older network so that you had these people to sort of regroup with when you finally, you know, did come back to Connecticut. Um, and at least you still had the friend circle intact, which I'm sure was helpful. Um, and I did want to ask you too, you know, we've mentioned the pandemic a couple of times today, and obviously we're living in, you know, sort of very uncertain times, and social networking has become more integral in, you know, keeping relationships connected. So I know that there's sort of two thoughts of thinking in terms of social media, because it can be beneficial to friendships, but it can also, you know, not be. Um, and I think that we're really having to reassess that given the situation and the circumstances that we're living through. So can you speak to social media? Oh, sure. Well, I did uh, uh, quite a bit of original research for Friendgevity. Um, I did surveys through SurveyMonkey of hundreds. And I was very impressed um, because as a researcher, I did attempt to keep an open mind, although I'll be honest, I was a teeny bit more towards the preconceived notion that social media is a negative when it comes to friendship. But I said, okay, let me see what the research tells me. And there, not only was I amazed at the percentage that were on Facebook, it was something like 81%. And these were, and, and the other interesting thing is that classmates.com that a lot of people don't think about, that was one of the early social medias for connection. You know, people are still using it. Right. Um, so, um, so in my survey, they checked off, you know, all the different um, social media with, um, you know, Facebook being the primary one. But, um, but there wasn't the negativity that I thought there was going to be. So, so that was very refreshing. And what I found from all the research, um, as well as interviews, and I did um, quite a few interviews uh, related to the pandemic um, and they're in the book. And I even got a uh, wonderful artist, um, Alvin Elvis to do a picture, an original artwork, which is at the beginning of the chapter on the impact of the pandemic on friendship of two women. Um, it's a black and white in the uh, print version and it's in color in the um, uh, ebook version, uh, two women communicating uh, but of course, it's uh, through uh, video conferencing and a, and a tablet or a computer. Um, but um, it was using uh, social media as an adjunct to the friendship. So for most people, uh, social media helps pre-existing friendships. It's Although there are people like uh, Lori Liu, a best-selling author, she and Reverend Cutcherfield, who were interviewed and quoted in the book, uh, they are friends through social media, through uh, the internet, and they've never met. Uh, they live far away. Their lives are busy. So there are those, you know, quote-unquote, FBF, I call them Facebook friends, but they're true friends. But for in general, social media helps to maintain a friendship. So the important theme there is with the pandemic, obviously it's a temporary thing. Hopefully we have vaccines. Hopefully 2021 is gonna be a lot different from 2020. So going back to the face-to-face, -face, going, but also even with the pandemic, you can pick up the phone. Um, social media, which tends to be text only and posting, needs the adjunct of 
phone calls, of texting, of Zooms. By the way, I did a Zoom birthday. And the only thing I regret, it was very, very uh, successful. I was absolutely amazed. There were 34 people at wow, my Zoom wonderful. birthday party. But when I teach a college course, the very first day we go around the Zoom because now uh, temporarily everything's distance learning and everyone gets to say, you know, what their name is, their major, why they're taking the course and one fun thing about themselves. And I do that with every college course and it's, it's really quite refreshing. I didn't do it with my birthday Zoom Oh, you got to regroup. <laughs> and I'm going to do another one, but I, I, and I, it bothered me for two or three days. Yeah. And I figured out that I was, and I came up with the word and it's a, it's a real word, but I haven't used this word for a long time. I was flustered. Oh, uh, of course. You know, now when I'm a college professor and I'm in charge of the class, it's like, okay, this is the time when you all introduce yourself. But with the Zoom birthday party, it's like, well, I was like a little kid, like, whoa, all these people are here because of me. But afterwards, my cousin, because I had quite a few cousins as well as friends, as well as uh, family members. My cousin says to me, oh, what's new with your sister-in-law? And I'm like, oh, she was there. <laughs> but since she hadn't been introduced, you know. So anyone who's listening to this, if you do a birthday Zoom or any kind of special occasion Zoom, remember to have everyone introduce him or herself. Great advice. I feel like we're all navigating uncharted territory and all of our best thoughts are hindsight, but I think that's fabulous that you did it you know why forego the celebration when you can just do it in a safe socially distant way well um, but the other but the other interesting thing is that for my birthday two years ago and it was such a a high number that i can't even say it <laughs> even though i knew no we're supposed to say oh you know 90 is the new 20 but but I had only about um, eight or nine close friends and relatives and my husband and I in a, a, a brunch at one of my favorite restaurants in New York, which hopefully is still there, Bond 45 off of Times Square. And that was just a very different experience, you know, so, so that's, but for many of us, you know, Zoom is a better alternative than no interaction. Absolutely. And I know that people are going to be curious now, so I'm just going to tell them Jane was referring to her 45th birthday if you need to know. Okay. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, yes, yes. Luckily, yeah. I can still remember 45. <laughs> that is good. <laughs> All right. So I am going to pivot quickly. So I did want to ask you, you know, some people are a little bit more extroverted and have an easier time making friends and other people, not so much. So do you have quick advice or guidance that you would give to people who are looking to make friends. And that can be, you know, in normal times in person or now that we sort of have to oh, sure. online. Well, I think especially for people who are introverted, um, let it grow out of your interests. Um, you know, gravitate to groups that uh, have shared interests with you. Um, Meetup is an option. Uh, practically everything's gone to online now, at least temporarily. Um, so, so let it grow out of your interests. And, uh, and also realize that everyone is on a certain level somewhat shy. And it's not just you. Um, if you do have even one friend, uh, see if that friend will include you in his or her activities. Uh, and be open to friendship, uh, you know, get away from the, the preconceived notion that you can't make friends after the school years. It's, it's just too difficult. Um, and don't be, I mean, here's the irony. You want to be open to friendship, but you have to be very careful about seeming desperate. Right. Uh, because, you know, remember back to high school, 
Who, who did everyone want to be friends with? The one who needed friends or the group that had, you know, was most popular? So, um, so it's kind of a, a balancing act, you know, be open to friendship, but, you know, don't, don't come off as, as too pushy, too needy and, um, and, and do have, and, and also explore interests, but see if it's going to be receptive to new friends or in the right age group or the right uh, demographic and be ready to move on quickly if it's not for you, uh, rather than wasting a lot of time. Sure. And, you know, one of the things I really enjoyed about the book, not to give it all away, and I won't, you know, we can sort of <laughs> leave it here, but I did just want to say that, you know, you sort of evaluate the entire life cycle and you look at different ages, different circumstances, and you give advice and guidance how to, you know, maintain, enhance, or, you know, even create friendships throughout all aspects of life, which I think is great. It's, it's not, you know, general guidance. It's very specific to your time in life, your circumstances in life. And I think that people would probably really benefit from that. Um, and I did want to ask you, you know, before we maybe move into a discussion of self-publishing about the idea of friendships at work, um, because I know that you were even mentioning when you moved to Nashville, in hindsight, maybe you would have wanted to get a job and had that way to meet people. Um, right. And, and it's a really interesting topic because those relationships in a workplace, um, there's a lot of you know, sort of elements that go into play there, you know, if there's different levels of power, prestige, um, you know, if somebody gets promoted, how that might change the dynamics of a friendship. So quickly, can you just talk a little bit about some of those? Sure. Well, I wrote a book called Who's That Sitting at My Desk? And in that book, I share a word I coined. I love coining words. I coined friendships. I coined friendivity. In that book, I coined the word workship. And a workship is a relationship at work that's more than a coworker or acquaintance, but less than a friend. And I recommend a workship initially um, because the stakes are really high in work and you have to be very careful um, what information you share. Uh, some of the most painful interviews I did and surveys I read were you know, one woman, she became friends with someone who had been hired for her department and she was asked to train her. And not only did she train her, but they became friends. And after a couple of months, she was advised that she was going to be let go and the person she trained, who had also become her friend, was replacing her. Mm -hmm. So she felt betrayal on two levels. And, you know, obviously couldn't believe that she had shared on a, per you know, she was probably more betrayed that she shared on a personal level as well as the business level. So, um, but uh, a lot of friendships start in the workplace they start as workships and then one or both leave and that becomes the the glue to the the genuine friendship because the stakes are so much uh safer you know someone goes to a different company someone even goes to a different type of career so now they can have that kind of really intimate self-disclosure friendship but the fact that they work together, whether it's for months or years, they got to know each other, they got to see their values, um, they have that, that bond of the shared experience. Absolutely. Um, and I wanted to mention too, you know, you, you shared that anecdote and for people who like, you know, anecdotal evidence, I think this book is great for that because obviously, you know, there's statistics, there's research, but there are these real stories of real people and real evolving friendships. And it's very enlightening, you know, to actually hear about somebody's experience in their own words. So, you well, know, one of, one of my favorite anecdotes is uh, related to the pandemic because, you know, for so many, the pandemic has been tragic and, 
you know, on so many levels. But for this one woman, she's a single woman. Uh, she went to uh, Latin America to go to a conference and um, she and about a dozen other people arrived and the pandemic uh, forced a lockdown in that country and the conference was canceled. They couldn't get back to their various countries. They were everywhere from Israel to the UK to the US. So they all decided to rent a house together in a town nearby. And for the next couple of months, they all lived together. They were able to get um, fast internet to keep their businesses going. And they became like a, a second family to each other. And when I interviewed her, she had been back in Queens for a couple of months, but she said that, you know, she formed this whole new network of friends. So the pandemic has, you know, actually uh, not been totally negative in terms of relationships for some people. Absolutely. And I just keep telling myself it's all about perspective. And I remember reading that story and thinking, wow, way to take, you know, this seemingly terrible situation and making something truly, you know, memorable and profound out of it. I thought that was terrific. Um, and I did, of course, want to ask you a bit about publishing traditionally versus self-publishing. Sure. I've done it all. You have. <laughs> you have. Well, I've published, I've published at this point, I did a Excel spreadsheet and I'm up to my 54th book. Oh my gosh, that's amazing. That yeah. is so awesome. But I did want to ask you because, you know, this book, uh, Frangevity, is out through your own publishing platform. Your last book, which is actually on the topic of self-publishing, was more traditionally published. So what kind of factors do you consider? And, my, and by the way, my previous friendship book was published by Simon & Schuster. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, you've, so. you've been the big houses, the small houses, your own platform. So you've right. really experienced it all. So I wanted to ask, you know, there are a lot of people who aren't sure how they want to pursue, you know, publication. So can you talk about right. it? Well, here's, here's my book on it, how to self-publish your book. Um, oh, and by the way, because when you are a self-publisher, you are the marketing department as well as the author and the publisher. So there's frangevity yeah. for everyone to see. Um, well, I, I think it's really important to do it on a book by book basis. Uh, too many people are, hey, I only have to go with a major house. Hey, I like indies. Hey, I gotta self-publish because I want total control. It really depends on the specific project. My next book that's coming out in March is called Help Yourself Now. And it's over 400, it's about 400 pages. And it's a directory of over a thousand ways to get help in 31 areas. And uh, every chapter has an introduction. And that's being done by um, Alworth Press, which is part of Skyhorse. Right. But they're distributed by Simon & Schuster. Right. So, so that was the right, the right way to go for that book. Uh, Frangevity uh, doing, I actually had at least two, possibly even three over the years offers to do Frangevity. And for various reasons, I felt I wanted to do it through my company with my vision, etc. cetera. Um, so one of the advantages of self-publishing is the total control. Um, you know, I hired um, Nancy Betra, a very talented cover designer. Um, I got to pick the title, uh, the subtitle, uh, I got to decide, you know, when it would be published, what it would cover. Um, with indie or major houses, uh, you know, there's a lot more compromising. Uh, so for some projects, it, it goes smoothly and that's absolutely comfortable. And for others, um, you know, it just is, um, is, is not going to work out. So so think about the project. Think about um, the specific publisher. 
Um, the, the most important thing, if you're not going to do it yourself, is to have an enthusiastic editor and an enthusiastic publishing company. Um, so, you know, it's, um, it, it, and, and they're, they're numbers oriented. Sure. Uh, so, you know, that's, uh, which, which can be a very good thing, but, you know, it's, um, uh, and I discuss all that in how to self-publish your book. Um, one of the things I recommend is, uh, I have a book called Foreign Rights and Wrongs, and whether you're self-published or with an indie house or an, a major house, you know, think of foreign rights. Uh, too few people are aware of the benefits of it. My book, When Friendship Hurts, I actually uh, was able to get into 29 languages. And Friendships, even though it was self-published, got into eight languages. So um, that's a wonderful way of spreading your influence internationally, additional revenue, and getting extra mileage out of the same book. Absolutely. Um, and so I guess final question for you, and then people are just going to have to pick up the books and read them themselves. Um, but I did want to ask you, you know, there has been a big shift, I think, in the perception, you know, of self-published books. When I started, you know, 15, 20 years ago, interviewing authors, um, you know, it, it wasn't embraced the way that it is today. And I think that because we just, we didn't necessarily know what the best practices were. And so people felt that those who weren't doing their due diligence were sort of giving self-publishing a stigma and a bad name. So briefly, would you mind touching on what you think some of the best practices are for people who are going to pursue self-publication versus something more traditional? Sure. Uh, well, one of the first things you have to do is make sure the book doesn't look self-published. Uh, if someone picks up the book and they say, oh, wow, this is a great book, that's all that matters. Um, I recommend self-publishers create a, a, type, a, 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 a name for the company. Um, if you are going to go with, you know, one of the major self-publishing venues, which is Amazon, uh, they're just printing the book and distributing it for you. They're not the publisher. Right. So you are the publisher. So, so go out of your way to create a name. Uh, it's up to you if you want to make an LLC or a corporation, but you definitely should have a name for your company. Um, one of the biggest mistakes people make is not knowing the difference between an editor and a proofreader. You need both. You need, and the editor could also be a copy editor or a development editor, but you need a separate person who's the final eyes for the book. And you want to go from the proofreading to the printer, because if you start rewriting after it's been proofread, you're going to introduce errors. Uh, you also want to make sure that you do all three formats because uh, a lot of people will say, oh, I can't afford to do an, an audio book. Well, you have wonderful opportunities such as ACX, which is a company owned by Amazon. Uh, they will do a royalty sharing arrangement and the narrator is also the producer. And it's a wonderful way of having an added way of people accessing your book. So I recommend doing all three, an ebook, a print book, and an audio book. Um, there's really no reason to say a book is self-published. It's really something you should focus on the content. Uh, the cover needs to look professional. Uh, the type uh, that you use should be the kind of type that is, um, you know, easy to read and, and typical. Uh, and remember that you are the publisher. It doesn't matter that it's self in front of that word. So every single function that a publisher would perform, you are going to have to perform for your own book. As I state in How to Self-Publish Your Book, 
So be prepared. Now, if it's too much for you, write the book and then go to a bookbaby.com go to i universe which i believe was the publisher for still alice uh, not the publisher the um self publishing company that um the professor used for still alice which actually went on to be bought by simon and schuster and became a big bestseller as well as a hit movie um so you don't have, that's another important theme. You don't have to do it all yourself. You have to know what you need to do, but it's okay if you hire an interior designer. It's okay if you hire a book, cover book designer. Um, it's okay if you hire a publicist um, because you don't have those skills. So, um, the only difference between a self-publisher and someone who goes to an indie house or a major house is that you are taking on all those functions, but be completely comfortable delegating, um, you know, hiring freelancers, working with companies like, um, you know, there's so many that are listed in my book that are excellent. Um, obviously, you're going to pay more money if you go with a company helping you than if you do everything yourself, but it might be worth it because you either don't have the time or the skills to uh, master all those um, uh, requirements. Uh, but for better or worse, you can't skip steps. Uh, the, 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 and, and you have to start off with a good book. Uh, that's, that, that not, nothing, trumps, uh, and I am using that word, but let me use a different word. Uh, nothing is replaces a good book. That That's the standing, the, the beginning, you know, and whoever publishes it, it's just a vehicle to getting it to the audience. Absolutely. That was that was an excellent breakdown. Thank you so much for that. And of course, if people want to learn more, they should definitely pick up how to self-publish your book. But I guess I already told you, I asked you my final question, but I lied. I have one more question. Oh. <laughs> but I figure, you know, we're talking connectivity. So I have to ask for people who might see this video and are looking to connect with you, who want to learn more, who might want to keep in touch. Sure. Where can they find you? Oh, sure. Well, my website, drjanyeager.com. There's a contact form. There's a form if you want to sign up for my newsletter, my occasional newsletter. Uh, there's a, uh, you know, there, my, they'll find my email there. Uh, many of my books are listed on the homepage. You can click on to order. Um, so, you know, I look forward to hearing from everyone. And um, Friendgevity is available. And... I'm very excited about how it's helping so many people. And, you know, I, I look forward to continuing to help people. And um, I also want to mention that I, I publish fiction as well. And that's listed at my website. I did an interview yesterday for a new book I'm working on. And the person I interviewed is an expert in dreams. And I told her that my novel, Just Your Everyday People, started out as a dream. So that was intriguing to her. Uh, oh. But one of my exciting things to accomplish is uh, motivating people to, to write that book if they have any wishes to write a book. And I even have a book called How to Finish Everything You Start, because there are too many unfinished books out there that need to see the light of print. I was going to say, I've read so many of your books. How have I not read that one? Because that's the one I probably need the most. <laughs> <laughs> well, Dr. Jan Yeager, thank you so much. This has been a pleasure. The book is Frangevity, which you can get right now. And I think now is the time, you know, this is such an important topic. So I really appreciate you being here today, sharing that with us. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks, John. Take care. You as well. That's it for this episode of Central Booking. Thanks for watching, and be sure to subscribe to our channel so you don't miss a thing.